It's a hot day, yet a good day to learn medicine. I am Dr. Abhishek, consultant physician, and let us start with today's topic: Varvula heart diseases, part one, mitral stenosis. We shall be discussing this topic under the headings of etiology, clinical features, diagnosis, and treatment. So let's start with a case scenario. 40-year-old male patient is brought into the hospital with acute onset left hemiparesis. On examination, pulse is irregularly irregular, and auscultation reveals a grade 3 mid-diastolic murmur in the mitral area. What is the probable diagnosis? Over here, let us analyze this question. Acute onset left hemiparesis is just a fancy term for stroke, and the patient's pulse is irregularly irregular, pathognomic of atrial. fibrillation next there is a grade 3 mid diastolic murmur in mitral area in the mitral area if there is a diastolic murmur it is always and always an ms so in this case the patient had an ms which was complicated by occurrence of an atrial fibrillation wherein there was a left atrial thrombus which embolized to cause a stroke i hope this is clear etiology always always remember in our country rheumatic heart disease all right next congenital it can be a part of coat riotum what it is we shall discuss in future classes on congenital heart disease next mitral valvular calcification what this means is that there is dystrophic calcification of the mitral leaflets wherein they are no longer pliable and can become stenosed autoimmune SLE and RA just remember a fancy term Liebmann Sack endocarditis which later on leads to cicatrization of the mitral valve or the apparatus infective endocarditis yes not as an acute phenomenon but down the line and finally LA myxoma wherein that LA myxoma itself is obstructing the flow from the LA to the LV now most importantly the pathophysiology So normally the valve area is about 4 to 6 cm. In severe MS drops down to 1.5. Very severe MS 1. So you can see that from the LA to the LV the gateway is closing slowly and slowly where you get severe and very severe. Now when I will tell of mitral valve it should be as a mitral valve apparatus. What it means is that you have an annulus which is fibrous on to which the leaflets are tethered or attached and finally what brings about the movement that is the connection to the papillae muscles through the chordae tendinae so it is always important to remember this topic in this that is mitral valve totality of the annulus the valve leaflets the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscle now elevated left atrioventricular pressure gradient and pulmonary hypertension what does this mean so imagine this is the la and then the lv you have the mitral valve that allows for the smooth movement of blood from the la into the lv now in ms if this becomes thickened or less mobile it acts like a check dam which reduces the flow from the la to the lv slowly what happens blood starts accumulating in the la that is the la starts to suffer from tension in acute cases this never happens because ms is a chronic case so as part of the accommodation to relieve that pressure from the la some blood is retained or there is a back flow into the pulmonary venous system from the pulmonary venous system there is again congestion leading to extravasation into the interstitium and the alveoli all right the lungs are supposed to be dry now there is fluid increasing in the lungs which is never a good sign so what does a poor heart do from the rv we know that blood reaches the lungs so over there they try to limit the amount of blood that is reaching the lungs it is a protective mechanism and that is why it is called a second stenosis that is pulmonary arterial hypertension it is a secondary stenosis and it is a compensatory mechanism in response to the pulmonary venous congestion so i hope that is clear lv cannot receive the blood because of the stenosis la dilates pressure increases to relieve the pressure blood is retained in the pulmonary venous system so the lungs are now becoming wet it is never good 
So from the ERV, it is the amount of blood is being limited by pulmonary arterial hypertension, where the pulmonary artery undergoes organization, becomes thickened, so that prevents the blood. All right. Now finally, reduced cardiac output. How is this happening? Again, we have the LA and the LV. From the LV, you have the effective cardiac output. But since the amount of blood entering the LV is less, there is not enough blood volume in the LV to result in an effective cardiac output. That is why most of these patients are always tired and fatigued because of the reduced cardiac output. All right. Now, the terminal events in a patient of MS, LA, there is dilatation, there is stasis of blood in the interior of the chamber, which can result in an LA thrombus. This is further worsened by the fact that when the LA is stretched, there is a chance for triggering atrial fibrillation. This is because of a prolonged diastolic tension on the LA. So AF leads to LA thrombus. LA thrombus can again embolize systemically to form, for example, cardioembolic strokes. I hope this is clear. So to review, LA, LP, RV, RA. So there is stenosis of the valve. There is decreased blood flow into the LV. There is LA dilatation. This dilatation and pressure overload is relieved onto the pulmonary venous system, which is never good. So from the RV, the pulmonary artery that supplies the lung undergoes secondary stenosis. This is a compensation. Now, after a point, the distended LV is under so much stress that there is triggering of diastolic failure and atrial fibrillation. Once atrial fibrillation is developed, there is an LA thrombus within the interiors of the LA which may be embolized to form complications of cardioembolic stroke. We are not limiting ourselves to cardioembolic, cardioembolic strokes, it can be into any system. Symptomatology. So what are the symptoms you usually enco uh, encounter in a patient of mitral stenosis? Breathlessness. Yes, that is because of pulmonary venous congestion. Fatigue. That is because of decreased cardiac output. Palpitation is because of atrial fibrillation. Hemoptysis, again, because of pulmonary venous congestion, waiting to burst all the small arteries on the veins, pulmonary venules in the lungs. Thromboembolism, again, is because of triggering of AF, wherein an LA thrombus is formed. Cough, again, pulmonary venous congestion. Chest pain, it is non specific but can be attributed to pulmonary venous congestion, palpitation, or pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, what you need to understand is that from the LA, the amount of blood reaching the LV is now reduced because there is a check dam in the form of thickened mitral valve. So somehow we know that the LA kind of contracts and compensates by releasing some amount of output or input into the LV. The heart rate is very important. So whenever there is a cardiac stress, there is tachycardia. Whenever there is tachycardia, the LV function or the LV filling becomes reduced. So whenever an MS patient encounters situations of increased cardiac stress, with change in heart rate or circulating blood volume, there will be decompensation. All right. And for understanding purposes, remember, if an AF is triggered, there is increased chance of mortality from cardioembolisms or pulmonary hypertension results in increased morbidity, wherein because the lungs are now wet, the patient has decreased exercise tolerance cough, etc. Now, in the clinic, how would you see this patient? There is a classic description of a mitral facies. This is a combination of venous congestion as well as decreased cardiac output. So along the lips and the nose, patient might be having some pallor, but along the malar areas, patient may appear flushed. This is the malar facies. All right. How do you differentiate from the lupus? In SLE2, you have malar rashes, but the midline is never affected. Now, A wave. What is the A wave in the JVP? It indicates the atrial contraction. That is just towards the end of the diastole. The LA contracts to push the blood into the LV. The patient develops AF. A wave will be absent. Parasternal heave. This indicates the right ventricular hypertrophy because of the pulmonary arterial hypertension. Diastolic thrill at the apex. Thrill is a palpable murmur. So when the MS has an higher intensity, you may be able to feel the thrill at the apex. Signs of RV failure, that is signs of congestion downstream. You may have ascites, 
टेंडर हेपिटोमेगली रेज जे वी पी और पीडलेडिमा इज जस्ट दैट दर इज वीनस कंजेशन नो नाउ माइट्रोस टीनोसिस मामा एस ट्राई टू डिस्क्राइब द एम एस मामा यू गो टू एन ओल्ड हाउस द डोर्स द हिंजेस आर ऑल ट्रस्टेड सो वेन नवर यू ओपन और क्लोज द डोर यू हैव अ साउंड एंड वेन द डोर इज सेमी ओपन वेन द विंड फ्लोस द डोर मूव्स हियर एंड द वाई ब्रेक्स क्रिएटिंग अ साउंड Just keep this imagery in your mind and let us see. Now, A to P to indicates closure of the aortic or the pulmonary valves. So once that is closed, diastole is triggered in the LV. So the LV is now waiting to get blood from the LA. Opening snap. That is a sudden opening of the mitral valve because it is thickened. It is like that rusted old door. So when it opens, it creates a sound. Opening snap. Next, as we enter into the mid. portions of diastole there is flow now but because the stenotic valves are in the way it creates a sound that is the mid diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis now the last portion we know that the poor lv needs the blood and the blood filling is slow so the left atria contracts to contribute to that final part of filling that is why you have an increased intensity of the murmurs towards the end that is before the systole starts that is why it's called pre systolic accentuation accentuation means increase and finally it is ready for the lv to go into systole so the valves close again and because it is stenotic again you have a sound all right just imagine that door which is rusted it will be very clear to you the difference between the closer of the s2 and starting of opening snap it gives an indication of how much pressure it now is between the la and the lv if the la pressures are very high then the opening snap will move a little closer to a to p2 now the duration of the mid diastolic murmur indicates the severity of mitral stenosis because it is in the way along the la pressures all right so the duration of the mdm indicates the severity of mitral stenosis now how do you investigate this patient ecg the most primordial investigation of cardiovascular system so because the la is now enlarging all the signs would be either related to the la pathology or the pulmonary changes so p mitral it indicates la enlargement remember mitral as being the etiology rvh it again indicates the secondary effects of the pulmonary venous congestion ecg will be taken separately don't worry af if you don't know anything just remember irregular rr interval with absent p waves okay done now chest x ray changes in changes in chest x ray again indicates the la enlargement so when it enlarges it pushes the things around here and there okay with that in mind let us see straight left heart border it indicates the la that is now slowly enlarging prominent pulmonary artery uh, because the pulmonary arterial hypertension dilated pulmonary veins that is cephalization is usually seen because of the congestion displaced esophagus in the lateral film if you see the patient as the la is enlarging it pushes the esophagus towards the back then curvy b lines it is an indication of interstitial edema we will cover that in topics of pulmonary edema now investigations the second series we will start with echo the basic idea of echo is to determine the viability of the mitral apparatus that is number 1 and second what are the existing pressure gradients between the la and the lv all right so let's see inflow velocity that is how much is the pressure gradient because as the pressure rises the velocity also increases next mitral orifice that is the area transvalvular gradient that is the pressure difference between the la and lv associated mr how can mr and ms exist in the same patient just imagine the patient had a rheumatic fever now he is an established case of rheumatic heart disease so the mitral valve initially becomes thickened next as the process worsens probably the caudate tendine becomes even more stenosed so if a valve was like this because of the caudate tendine damage it now starts to open up a bit and there are features of ms and mr all right a valve which was stenosed slowly becomes regurgitated more i hope that is clear finally distortion of the mitral apparatus what we have demonstrated always remember mitral annulus 
leaflet, cordotendine, and papillary muscle. Finally, we all know that the transesophageal echo is always better than transthoracic because it gives a better definition of the mitral apparatus. Now, cardiac catheterization it helps in determining the pulmonary hypertension as well as it is very important, especially if it's in an elderly patient, 40 plus. You need to know the status of the coronaries because if the coronaries are compromised, we should treat that first before dealing with the valve. Treatment. Now, the medical aspects of treatment are all focused upon maintaining a sinus rhythm wherever possible and preventing an LA thrombus from being formed. So, rhythm or rate control are indirectly referring to treatment of atrial fibrillation. We could use digoxin, a beta blocker or amiodarone. We shall discuss all this in later chapters on atrial fibrillation. Just remember, control AF. Next, anticoagulation. That is, especially if there is a risk of an LA thrombus. Alright, as per Harrison's, the only drug now is warfarin. But people do use Ebixivan and Rivaroxivan. Alright, I hope this is clear. Control the AF and prevent a thrombosis. Next, if the patient is acutely in pulmonary edema, you could use drugs like di uh, diuretics. But that is not relevant to our topic per se. Now, a proper management. What should we do? So, PBMV stands for percutaneous balloon mitral valvotomy, wherein it's a catheter based process. When the valve is stenosed, you just open it up. Alright, so there is flow now. And mitral valve replacement is replacement of the valve. Now, what are some factors that you should consider while deciding the treatment modality? Number one, is there a thrombus? Imagine there is an LA thrombus. I go and open up the valve, the will embolize. So, never do that. Leaflet pliability. The leaflets are very stiff. There is no point in opening them up. It is useless. Subvalvular apparatus. Again, we know that the motion depends upon the integrity of the mitral apparatus as a whole. So, if it is damaged in any parts, better to go for a replacement. And finally, the surgical risk. The patient is having very, uh, very bad fitness or is unfit for surgery. Go for some minimally invasive procedures. I hope this is clear. So, now let's recap. Under etiology, always remember RVH or RHD. I'm very sorry, RHD. Murmur. What is the murmur or the components? It has a loud S1, mid diastolic murmur with a pre systolic accentuation along with an opening snap. Complications, remember two, the most two cardinal important complications, pulmonary hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Medical treatment is regarding AF control and then to prevent the LA thrombus formation. Surgical refers to either percutaneous balloon mitral valvotomy or mitral valve replacement. Alright, so the references for this discussion were from Davidson's principles and practice of medicine and Harrison's principles of internal medicine. MCQs, MCQ1. Digitalis is used in mitral stenosis when the patient develops. Digitalis, otherwise devolves A. Atrial fibrillation. B. Right ventricular failure. C. Acute pulmonary edema or D. Myocarditis. Straightforward question. Atrial fibrillation. MCQ2. In mitral stenosis, the double atrial shadow is due to enlargement of what enlarges in MS? LA. Over. MCQ3. Severity of mitral stenosis is best identified by A. Loud S1 B. Loud opening snap C. Duration of the mid-diastolic murmur and D. Intensity of the mid-diastolic murmur The answer here is Duration of mid-diastolic murmur which we have already discussed Now, loud S1, loud opening snap all these, they tend to disappear as the calcification or the disease worsens or if there is an associated MR Alright? Done. MCQ4. Which among the following is the procedure of choice in a young patient with mitral stenosis? The main point here is young. So we assume that the pulmonary leaflets or the mitral leaflets are intact or mobile. Now let's see the options. Mitral valve replacement, surgical valvotomy, surgical valvuloplasty and percutaneous balloon mitral valvotomy. Here the answer is D. MCQ5. All are causes of hemoptysis in a mitral stenosis except 
A. Pulmonary venous hypertension B. Pulmonary arterial hypertension C. Pulmonary edema or D. Resolving pneumonitis We have discussed this. The answer is Pulmonary arterial hypertension which is regarded as a secondary stenosis and is protective against hemoptysis. Pulmonary venous hypertension leads to pulmonary venous congestion. Yes. Pulmonary edema. Whenever the heart fails, it becomes frank edema. And D. Resolving pneumonitis. These patients tend to have on and off episodes of pneumonitis because lungs are now wet because of interstitial edema. MCQ 6. Features of mitral stenosis on chest X-ray are all except A. Splaying of carinal angle B. Lifting of left main bronchus C. Lower low prominence of veins and D. Double contour of the right border As the LA enlarges, it pushes things up to the side, to the right So, splaying of carinal angle, LA enlarges So, it pushes the carinal angle Lifting of the left main bronchus it lifts the left main bronchus as it enlarges D. Double contour of the right border you have the right atrium, the left atrium is now slowly pushing its way. So again, there is a double contour or the double atrial shadow. Lower lobe prominence of veins never occurs. Usually the upper lobes because of the venous congestion. The answer here is C. Dokumi.